26 years ago, a 14-year-old boy found himself in the midst of the horrors of war in Bosnia. That little boy was I. Amongst the most striking memories from this time were the 56 days that I and my mother spent in one of many infamous concentration camps in this region. Now imagine the emotional turmoil of a 14-year-old in such circumstances. With nights came beatings, rapes, killings. So I feared the night, we all did. But each night, as I would lay my head down to the blanket-covered hard floor to trick fear and get some sleep, I'd hear this angelic voice, almost like a whispering, singing this soft, sweet, sad melody, yet comforting. That was my mother singing into my ear, soothing my scared young soul, breathing the life back into my empty lungs. Since then and to this day, music was always at the core of everything I am, configurating my identity, breathing life into my lungs. I know that music saved my life the same way it has done many times again ever since. It's what it still does every day. Now fast forward 26 years, this is Nick Cave, claimed Australian artist, poet, songwriter, lecturer, and an iconic figure in alternative rock scene for more than three decades. This photo is from a shooting of a documentary called One More Time with Feeling. So what's special with this film? Well, it's the first sign of life that Nick Cave gave to the public since the tragic death of his son, who died two years before this, only 15 years old. I still remember sitting there at the movie theater and gasping for breath. The film was nothing close to anything I've ever seen before. A contrasting combination of that vintage film noir flavor and modern 3D technology provided this sense of being stuck between a forever gone past and an eternally proximate free future betwixt and between the two worlds. Camera angles provided a voyeuristic peep into the most private chambers of a hard work artist's soul. The film was a healing ritual. His attempt at attending to those sore dimensions of his human self that conventional medicine simply couldn't. The album and the, f and the world tour that followed were also part of this run of rituals, all expressions of personal loss and suffering, but at the same time monuments of the universal humanity within him. Now this is a shot, uh, short clip of a show from this very tour. I shot it myself, so I apologize for pure video and audio quality. Uh, but I really want to share this with you because something extraordinary is happening here. So let's take a look. Billy Dilly kneels down and slobbers on his head. Stag fills him for the lead. Bah, 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 bah. This is what uh, sociologist Emil Durkheim has termed collective effervescence. 
uh, which refers to when a large number of people come together and participate in the same action and simultaneously express and communicate the same sentiment. Uh, now, this show was at Ericsson Globe venue in Stockholm, drawing a crowd, maybe eight, nine thousand people. Not all of them lost their sons, but the deep sensibility communicated through the primal force of art taking place here made it possible for all of them to relate in some way, to recognize their own losses in Nick Cave's loss and also in each other's losses, to heal through mirroring their own pain and suffering in Nick Cave's pain and suffering and also in each other's pain and suffering. The shared sentiment was so thick you could almost cut through it with a knife. That's what we medical anthropologists have referred to as understanding and bonding in human suffering, this unmistakable gut feeling of mutual recognition that provides comfort and relief not by running away from the pain, but by social act of acknowledging it. This is where our private malady is transformed into a collective concern. That night, the crowd wept together as one about the loss, pain and suffering, but these people also celebrated their humanity, gorging in art-enhanced mutual recognition that gave strength and restored sense of meaning. Now, I don't know if you could notice, but there is no stage barrier, which is always at place in large rock shows. There is literally nothing separating K from the, from the uh, audience. And the interesting, interesting thing is that he is really trying to take, make the most out of this boundlessness, this limitlessness. So, so he leans onto the stretched out arms and the hands and allows them to touch and hold him he disappears into the sea of crowd and uh, just to come back a few seconds later or to appear at the other side of the venue. Uh, what's, he, what's he doing then? Well, it seemed to me that he was persistently tearing down anything that might hinder the mutual understanding and bonding. Uh, this experience resembled a familiar feeling that I had nearly a decade ago when I did a field work as a medical anthropologist at a hospital with people suffering from uh, life-threatening heart conditions. And their life narrative kind of looked the same as mine. I, uh, mine was torn by war, they was torn by a condition, a difficult heart condition. There is a tragic moment happening, a disruption in a life narrative that was quite similar. And it, it also is something that really surfaces in Nick Cave's art. This, this tragic loss is at the core of what we are viewing here. Uh, I could identify with Nick Cave's loss and was thereby also uh, able to engage in this collective understanding and bonding uh, with the crowd at the show. Um, what we all shared was this crisis brought by disruption of a life narrative due to something bad. We were all butterflies caught in a diving bell, neither here nor there, with one life forever gone and other one forever out of reach. Rewind back some 40,000 years and get to another kind of cave. The earliest known examples of art being used to simply amplify the senses and awareness are the wall paintings of Ice Age cave dwellers. Since its prehistoric use, art has remained both an expression but also a key nutrient of human culture. Every human society has used arts to express its ideas and to make sense of the world. Art educates us, inspires us, art beautifies us, and it is also the thing that separates us from other earthly creatures. During the Renaissance, paintings were understood to have intense effects on health and emotional balance of viewers, even their children, and to make them behave properly. In 8th, in 8th century BC, and uh, back to music, we can read about healing incantations already in the Odyssey. While on a hunting expedition in his youth, Odysseus was gored by a wild boar, which left the scar on his, on his thigh. His companions healed his wound and stopped its bleeding with an incantation, a chant, a song. All known cult cultures have used and enjoyed music. Music's therapeutic uh, characteristics were not always mentioned. 
but it was always there. In 5th century Athens, Pythagoras used to play and sing paeans, which are joyous songs, to his disciples to bring them in a serene mode. Plato's pupil, Xenocrates, used instrumental music to cure hysterics. But however interesting these historic examples are often anecdotal and give no valid proof of the therapeutic feature of arts. So how about that evidence of arts worth? I'd like to mention a recent report uh, that had caught my eye. All-party parliamentary group on arts, health and well-being in the UK launched this report last year. Uh, it provides an overview and it includes descriptions of a wide range of artistic and creative activities in healthcare as well as in social care and uh, puts together evidence for the contributions that arts can make to people's lives. Art Lift, for instance, is an arts and prescription initiative where patients get to take part in activities led by professional artists in poetry, ceramics, painting and more. After six months of working with an artist, people had 37 percent less demand for GP appointments and their need for hospital admissions dropped by 27 percent, which gave a net saving of 216 pounds per patient for national health services. Some 10 million working days are lost to sick leave among health workers, costing 2.4 billion pounds a year. Inclusion of arts in the formation and professional development of healthcare workers improves their own well health and well-being and also through that health and well-being of their patients. But the report also makes another important point and it's the value of arts must not be reduced to being cheap. This is very important. So it states, when considering the value of arts in health and well-being, it should be borne in mind that successful participatory act projects are of much greater value to the individuals that take part than the economic benefits they may represent for health or other agencies. In other words, the difference that arts participation makes to people's lives often transcends economic value. So instead of talking about the value of arts, we should be talking about the impact of arts, which we are doing to today. Uh, engaging with arts enables us to get in touch with our existential selves, enhance our own subjectivity, ensure sense of dignity and self-worth. With the ad advance of modern neuroimaging uh, techniques during the past decades, we are now beginning to better understand what goes on in the brain when we listen and play music, and how the structure and function of the brain can change as a result of musical training. We didn't know this before, now we know for sure. In a recent study at Olbor University in Denmark, more than 14,000 people uh, participated and got to answer questions about their health and, mu uh, and their music habits. The researchers saw a clear pattern between good health and attendance at live music shows. Now, I met many skeptics saying the impact of arts and culture on our health and well-being is an unexplored field, uh, hard to measure, and that there's just not enough evidence uh, to support this theory. The fact is that there is an abundance of uh, scientific evidence and it's growing as we speak continuously. Uh, for those genuinely interested in the impact of arts and culture on our health, it's easily found. The skeptics Skeptics are skeptics because they have been trained to look at things differently and the not measurable kind of knowledge is also considered a threat to a good knowledge. Uh, but we now know that medical humanities have a lot to bring to table when it concerns uh, relevance of arts and culture to health issues. All art forms, be it literature, performing or visual arts, have this innate ability to communicate, that is, to speak of and to speak to those existential elements of being human. It is in and through arts that we can give form and substance to our emotional lives and complex thoughts in ways compared to which any other documentation or account comes across as rather feeble. When we come together across sectors, across scientific disciplines, across professions, this is also when we will be breaking new ground for the ways 
in which we recognize and treat people not only as physical and biological bodies, but also as thinking and feeling subjects. And we are already halfway there, right on the verge of the new paradigm. Thank you. Thank you.